Okay. Hi, everybody. My name's David. I uh, work at Meta with uh, BPF folks and uh, on the scheduler. And I want to talk about uh, multi K func sets, which is a horrible name for uh, what's essentially scoping uh, specific K funks to only be called from specific struct, struct ops callbacks. So here's the agenda. I'm going to try to speed run this a little bit to get us a little, bit, uh, a little back on track. Um, to give a little background, struct ops are a way for uh, uh, BPF programs to implement callbacks that can be invoked from the kernel to implement certain fun functionality in the kernel. Um, so we have, for example, HID BPF, which we've spoken about, uses this TCP congestion control. And then for SCED EXT, which is the BPF scheduler that we, we've all been talking about, um, the BPF program implements callbacks that are invoked from the core scheduler. For example, uh, enqueuing, uh, enqueuing a task in the scheduler and, and stuff like that. Um, just like the kernel can call into struct ops, struct ops can call back into the main kernel uh, using kfunks. Um, on the prior slide, we had this uh, example in queue program right here, which is again the in queue callback. Well, that can call kfunks. The example that I gave here is an RCU uh, RCU lock. Sorry if the text is kind of small, uh, but the point is you can you can call back into the main kernel um, using kfunks from struct ops callbacks. So what's the feature? Um, Basically, it's that kfunks aren't safe to call in every context. So right now, we specify, when you, when you register kfunks, you can specify what program type those kfunks can be invoked from. So you can, you can scope kfunks to only be invoked from struct ops programs, um, but you can't specify exactly which callbacks you, you care about. So uh, for example, for SCED EXT, we have this SCX BPF dispatch. Uh, can, you, can you see this, or is this too small? It's good, okay. Um, we have this SCX BPF dispatch kfunk, and I won't go into all the details about what that does now. We'll talk about that in the SCEDI XT presentation on Wednesday. Um, but basically, that's you taking a task that was enqueued in the BPF scheduler and putting it um, onto a dispatch queue or putting it right onto a CPU. And so obviously, from certain callbacks, that would make no sense like if, if a task was waking up. There's this ops.selectCPU callback in struct ops where uh, you decide which run queue or which CPU it should be migrated to before it's enqueued. Um, and it can actually be unsafe to, uh, to call certain kfunks um, because maybe the kernel is going to set some state, call the, the struct ops callback, and expect that state to be set if it gets called back into um, from BPF. And then lastly, uh, it gets kind of complicated because kfunks can nest. So you can, you can have a struct ops callback get invoked by the kernel, and then you invoke another, uh, another kfunk which itself calls the struct ops callback, or you know, there's like a timer interrupt that goes off, and you get another struct ops callback um, called in the timer interrupt, where you get another kfunk invoked. So there's a kind of delicate balance of, of uh, when you can call kfunks. You can deadlock yourself if you're not careful. Um, you can have you know invalid memory. All, all sorts of things can happen. Um, and so that's the request. Uh, we need to figure out a way to restrict kfunks to specific struct ops callbacks in specific contexts, and more generally, if, if it ends up making sense. Uh, to do that. Uh, we ideally could also maybe specify how kfunks can be nested, and it would be nice to be able to do that statically, um, because I think you know, it really probably should be statically defined. If, if, if you can have a circular, de circular dependency, then you could potentially deadlock no matter what. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me just see here. Another nice feature, which isn't really as pressing, but would be, would be nice, is if you could have kfunks, which in different contexts in a BPF program actually called out to different functions in the main kernel. Um, for example, I'll again talk about this when I talk about SCED EXT, but you can actually dispatch from different contexts. In one of the contexts, you can, you can send a task to a different CPU, and in another context, you can only directly dispatch it to your own CPU, so it might give us a chance to simplify the kernel if, if we, could, we could specify you know, which, which implementation should do what. And, um, this is, I think this is really important for struct ops and kfunk specifically because the kind of goal, the direction that we're going in uh, for this at least use case for BPF is we want to allow, allow developers elsewhere in the kernel that aren't you know, core BPF developers to be able to integrate BPF into their subsystem and sort of gracefully um, extend, use BPF to sort of implement different functionality instead of having to take UAPI dependencies or whatnot. And, you know, right now, uh, any kfunks they add, you can call from your, your own struct ops callback, and it's totally unsafe. So I think it's, it's kind of an important feature. 
Um, okay, so how do we do it? What ideas do I have? Um, okay, is that visible? Well, I'm gonna assume it is. <laughs> um, in SCADIXT, we defined a set of, uh, a set of flags which uh, you statically specify when you, uh, in like a macro, when you perform the kfunk. Um, and in that macro, we call some function in uh, SCADIXT, which does a static check to decide if you're actually allowed to be calling it in that context. So you call, you know, I'm going to call this in queue callback. This is the map. This is the mask of context where it's allowed to be invoked from. We we record a mask uh, when we do that, the flags, and then if if you call another kfunk later on, and you know you're invalid doing an invalid nest, or something like that, we'll do a warn a warn so that we can figure it out. And so obviously the implication here is this is all static, and we should never we should never hit this warning if we're doing things correctly. Um, and this is an example of, uh, yeah, this is the where we check whether it's allowed or not. We have this mask here, which is, again, uh, corresponds to one of these. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, that's the basic idea. So this is just how we did it to be able to unblock Sketty XT from, um, you know, from being dependent on this feature because, again, it would be unsafe to use otherwise. Um, but we can do other things, you know, uh, when we when we generalize this to to BPF um, more broadly. Um, yeah, so we use a bit and global mass to track which kfunks can be invoked, and then in the kfunk again, just to be clear, that you would call this this kf allowed function and return uh, rejected if if you weren't allowed to be called from that context. So, for SCX BPF dispatch number slots, if uh, you're calling it from the wrong context. You will be able to make the KFUN call from the BPF program currently, um, but we'll reject it here and then we'll kick out the scheduler because it was doing something it shouldn't be doing. Um, can we just find one per callback? Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, I'm trying to remember what, what I meant by this slide. Um, yeah, so when we specify, okay, I don't even remember. I'll look at this later, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so that's the basic, uh, that's the basic feature. Um, does anybody have any any thoughts or questions? There's one in the back, oh, and for Martin. Yeah, um, there's a patch set in RDT about the BPF salt destroy. So, so one of the uh, requirement there is uh, only limited for only limit a K fun to uh, a particular expect attached type. Mm -hmm. So one of the patch there has a um, add a filter light of callback during the verifier. To work. So what that filter does is it it, it has it it has a uh, BPI program pointer, so you can track for. Right now, you only track for the expected uh, attached type to a particular type, uh, but potentially it could filter more things. Um, but what you're suggesting here is more like a runtime, putting it in the current task. Um, yeah. To to track it in in the runtime way. Right? Which so. is which is certainly not preferable um, because. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's all statically verifiable, so you should, we should be able to do it, I think, at, at load time. That but for some of the, let's say, backlog, right, um, I think you need you need to check whether, like, k A has been called before, before you allow it to call k A again, right? That will be something that need to be checked in runtime, or in, in verify can also check that also. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how we would do it at, I haven't thought really about how we would represent it such that we could be sure to verify nested contacts and whatnot in the verifier. Um, for something like, for callbacks, for example, that you would never expect to be invoked, or kfunks you would never expect to be invoked um, in like a non -sleep, in a sleepable context, potentially we could do some stuff like that. Like, okay, so there's, there's, a, f there's a few kfunks that, like in the init callback and whatnot and sleepable where you know, you can you can expect basically everything else to be nested because if a timer interrupt goes off and calls into the scheduler, you know, there's a ton of kfunks we could take from there. So that boundary, I think it's probably not too bad. But you know, even within the the sleepable boundary, there's 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 nesting rules, or, um, or rather, there's different contexts. I don't think you can nest for that, but there's different contexts where certain kfunks should be allowed and certain ones shouldn't. But um, but yeah, I mean, having uh, I, I don't quite I'm not quite following the the explanation you gave about specifying the filters because I, I haven't seen the code but um, I'll take a look at it and see if we could if we could leverage that yeah it's a good suggestion okay all right uh, 
Thanks, everybody. Let me move Sorry, on quick, to Sorry, quick oh. question. Is that, is that online? No, oh, it's back there. Okay, back there. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe this is like, a, you know, when all you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail thing. But mm -hmm. uh, since we've been talking about BTF tags a lot today, it just dawned on me that maybe BTF tags could be used for this somehow. Because the struct ops definition, you can tag arbitrary functions there. Uh, arbitrary struct ops callbacks pointers there. And also tag the kfunks with something similar. It's an interesting suggestion. I mean, I think you could you could use that to specify which specific callbacks you're allowed to be invoked from. But if we wanted to also have verification for like proper nesting and whatnot, mm. I think yeah, I think that would have to be done at runtime. Um, but maybe yeah, for for uh, for just statically defining which which callbacks you can be invoked from, that's that's a possibility for sure. Um, honestly, I mean, I, I think we need something in the short term. It's not not critical, but uh, but it's uh, it's it, 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 it will put a lot less burden on people implementing kfunks if we have something like this, so that you don't have to you don't have to protect yourself and be correct. Okay, awesome. So the next one is is <laughs> pretty harebrained, even more th more so than that one. It's it's kind of interesting, and uh, it goes a little bit towards usability, which we were alluding to earlier. Um, so the feature is called local storage user space mapping, and as you probably guessed, uh, yeah, and it's 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 this would be very complex, and it needs a lot more thoughts and details. And so I wanted to talk about it in the room uh, because um, I wanted to get your thoughts and feedback on it. But it needs a lot more, you know, really thinking through all the implications and whatnot for this to work. Um, but yeah, so we have maps, uh, local storage maps where if you have a kernel object, uh, currently, I may be missing one, but currently, if you have a task struct or you have a C group struct, you can define a map type where you can implement storage uh, for each of those types. So for example, in Sketty XT, if you have um, a task struct that's passed to the DNQ callback, you could have a task storage or a BPF map type task storage map where you store something um, for that task and then you can pass the task as a key get back a pointer to some some uh, some memory and then and then query or write to that memory and so this is this is what the map would look like if we have like a, a bool boolean where we force the the task to be local meaning stay in the current CPU and then we have a per task CPU mask which specifies which uh, CPUs we want the task to be able to run on um, we could get that by uh, by querying it and this is an example of how you can create uh, create the the storage you can pass this this flag to BPF task storage get. Um, and then a pointer to the map, and then it'll, it'll return a, a pointer to the to the storage if you're able to allocate it. And here's an example of it actually being used. Okay, yeah, great. So here we check um, if uh, we we on the left side there if we uh, we can find an idle CPU for for the task to run on. Um, we set force local, and then later on on the right side in the NQ callback, um, if that flag is set, then we we just keep it on the current CPU, um, and we unset that the, the flag so we have it for next time. So it's a really, it's a very useful um, API, especially for Sketty XT. It's been extremely useful. Um, uh, in terms of how it's implemented, I won't go into too much detail because I don't fully understand it, but the gist of it is that we have in the task struct and we have another one in the C group struct, we have this BPF local storage object. Um, and in that object, uh, we have a hash map where we cache, uh, we cache the, uh, the local storage entries for, the, for that task. Otherwise, we have a list where we store all of them if it's not in the not in the cache. Because the idea is, if you have you know like let's say, on the extreme case, you have like a thousand local storage entries because you have all these different maps for the task. You'd have a cache so that you didn't have to do an O of O of n lookup every time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's how it works. Don't need to look at the allocator. Okay, so the feature would be, um, and then the last thing I'll sh I should say, which I didn't put in the presentation, is that. Uh, um, you can't access this from user, user space at all, at least as far as I understand. This is only for use in the kernel program directly. Um, but that being said, a lot of people need this uh, to access it from user space. So in, at Google um, and Ghost, they use something, they define apparently this giant map type, uh, this giant array, excuse me, map, um, which contains you know, enough entries for every task on the system. And if they want to set some per task uh, context from user space, they just index into it by PID and set the, set the context. Um, we use something similar in Sketty XT in our kind of main scheduler, which we call Atropo, which has a load balancer in Rust um, in user space. Uh, we, we set 
uh, state in, in, a, in a hash map, essentially, which is indexed by PID. And then in, in kernel space, you do a lookup, and that, that informs if you should load balance to different CPUs and stuff like that. Um, so the idea is, you know, there, there's ways around it. You can use you can use array maps, you can use hash maps. What you really want is the map type that kernel space is using. So, um, yeah, you can use statically sized maps, but it's wasteful. And I mean, the point of having these these uh, C group storage and and task storage is so that you don't have to uh, don't have to do this kind of thing. Um, yeah. So how would we do it though? I mean, it's it's a very very difficult problem, I think, because. Uh, you know, we don't really have, as far as I know, like variable mappings in libbpf yet. Um, and you know, right now we're putting the storage directly in the task, so it would be entirely an entirely different approach. Um, the only way that I can think of for now is to have something like a local storage allocator, where, for an instance, John, did you want to say something? Uh, sure, I, I guess. Do you mind if I interrupt your talk? No, no, no. no. Uh, okay, Sorry. cool. Um, just one comment, I guess, about the size of the pre-allocated. I, I was worried about this for a long time, um, but then I, then I realized, depending on how big your objects are, even if your objects are a couple hundred bytes, right, that you're sticking in there, a four megabyte hash map can fit, you know, 32,000 PIDs. So, like... <clears throat> I mean, if you have, so so my my point is just that like, I was I was really worried about the size of that map for a long time. It's actually not that big, right? Well, I, I mean, okay, yes, it depends on like context depends on on context, right? I mean, in yeah. some contexts, on a server, four megs is probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, if we want BPF to also be able to run on like VR devices and stuff like that, it might be less less sure. applicable. I agree, though. I mean, it's not like it's not like you're taking up gigs of memory or anything like that. Yeah, um, so th that was all. It was just a, like a, a side comment. So yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point though. Um, I, and I think yeah, for me, like the main thing is clearly this is something that would be useful to people, right? Like people are using it. We have per task storage in the kernel, and we have per C group storage for a reason. And so it feels like if we can kind of connect those two, and somehow use it from user space, we would be addressing, we would be addressing these use cases and kind of unifying the intention of the uh, those local storage map types. But maybe it's not worth it because it's really complicated. <laughs> I think you would have to have a local storage allocator where um, when you create a local storage entry in a map, we have an allocator that will allocate pages lazily um, and put these entries, you know, basically jam them onto these pages, which are then mapped from user space. Um, I don't know how we, I don't think we would want to do any kind of like runtime remapping in libbpf. So I imagine that we would have to pre-map pre some range of memory Make some of most of the pages unused, and then as more entries are added, we would have to change the page table entries in a do TLB flush um, in order for user space to use them, and then otherwise they fault or we like zero map it or something like that. So, so can I? Sorry, interrupt you again. Is the is the root problem that you need um, a storage space that grows with the problem? Are you trying to build like a like a, I guess I'm I'm missing what the local part of that storage is. Is it just that you need a storage block? That you can grow as as the, kind of time goes on, or is it, am I missing something? So the, the local part is is that it's per task or per C group. So if you so in this example, let's say that we did this Atlas harebrained allocator that I'm talking about. Yeah. If you had 20 task local storage entries, that would be 20 entries across yeah. 20 different tasks, and you would jam those onto the minimum number of pages that you mm -hmm. need, and that that extent would be what was mapped from from user space. And in order to do that, you would have to have some kind of IDR layer from user space because now you're not indexing, you're not just doing an index by the PID or you're not doing like an, ind you know, you're not just doing a lookup on the task. So you would need some integration with libbpf where uh, you would be able to map a PID or, or you know, something to, to the offset into this mapping that corresponds to the local storage entry um, for, for that task. I mean, is the problem that you can't read the local task storage from user space then? You can't read it, yeah. I mean, that's, that's this is what embedded, you're trying to solve. It's okay. embedded inside the task, so you can't, yeah. Uh, I, know, I, just, I didn't understand that. Um, actually, you can? one comment we can, yeah. Oh. Oh, but, but, but you need a P, I, I'm not a task guy, but, <laughs> but you, you need a PIDFD. I don't know what it is, but, but it, you need a P, what they call PIDFD um, to get to the, it's a it's a regular map lookup, right? So task local storage is a is a map. So so you say BPF map lookup element, the key will be the PIDFD. And you do that for every single task. 
Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, this this is also being done on like, um, you know, on every like scheduling. So for Ghost, they're actually they're actually running the scheduler in user space for every task. So it's I guess you're right. It, it is possible to map it from user space. I wasn't aware that you could do that. Um, but a we probably want to have writable entries from user space. Um, so for for the use case for Ghost and Sketty XC, that would be applicable. Um, it is writable also. So. It is. Yeah. But how mean, can you, you can use a BPF like iterator, and uh, for all this local storage, we already have a SK local storage. You can get the, all the up-to-date information. And otherwise, I would exceed consider and uh, the task command go, socket command go, it will be really complicated and what? to manage these things in kernel. How would you how would you do a writable mapping if you have like a K pointer or something? No, no, like you that don't you, you don't do the writable mapping and you can just use the existing interface and do an update with FD, for example the task uh, FD and the PID FD and you should be able to write some information. Right, but, so do you have to make a system call to do the write? Yeah. Okay, so existing yeah, I mean that's be able to do that. So it's it's not it's not quite the same thing, right? It's it's like not like the same thing. A little bit less less performant, and uh, because the memory map much faster. What I say just memory map seems more complex. Yeah, no, it's see the second slide in the recent day. It's oh, definitely yeah, yeah, complex. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's and it might not be worth doing. It's just the the, the truth is that uh, there's a comment coming back there. I'll say something while oh you're good. The truth is that it's it's not like it, it would never be okay for Ghost or for Atropo to be using like an iterator where you're making a syscall repeatedly or like doing something like that. I mean, it would just never it would never be usable in production. I think with that kind of overhead. Okay, he said with with iterators you can specify a parameter with an FD and just poke into that specific one. Okay, well I'll let you talk in that. Front. Um, is what you're suggesting implying that? for every release of a task struct, for example, would you have to do a TLB shoot down? Um, because like, if you need to unmap the page, right? And whenever a task is released, you would have to unmap a full page. So you would have to deal with, well, so it wouldn't be one task per page. It would be, it would be multiple t TLS entries per page. So you would need to so do also copy and write. You would need to. You would. You would probably need to do a TLB shootdown if you were like decreasing, like defragmenting or something, and like, okay, like all of the entries on this page are gone, so we're going to free this page. You would have to do a shootdown so that the page wasn't mapped anymore. Yeah. But if the task struct is freed, like you cannot keep it mapped, right? The task struct is not mapped. Like so, these entries are separate storage altogether, right? And um, yeah, so in the task struct, that's where we have the like the list head, but. The actual storage is just allocated yeah, with a BPF mem alloc. How is, a, is the question? Then when a task dies, do you create a host in your page? Yeah, we have to figure that out. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a few issues that I also didn't talk about, which is, again, the fragmentation. So um, you, we would eventually probably want to get rid of all the holes in the page and, and, and you know, aggregate them. I don't know how you would synchronize with user space to do that. Um, Andre? How frequently do you plan to access this test local, task local storage? Very, very, very frequently. Like if for Ghost, they're doing it literally for every in queue operation, like for multiple different scheduling operations. For, uh, for Sketty XT, we do load balancing fairly infrequently, so it wouldn't be quite as important. It's like you can configure it, but it, every couple of seconds um, is, is when it's accessed, so it's not as bad. I mean, again, it's it's doable. And Martin has a comment. It's doable with a map type array. It's it's fine. It's just this is another like this is another example of multiple people kind of hacking around things. If you want to call it a hack with the same thing, Martin. So, um, so the, if I understand correctly, the, the use case is like once in a while you will want to update the um, task local storage for every task in this in this task local storage map. You do have to do iterate. Yeah, you have to iterate frequently, um, okay. especially if you're doing load balancing, uh, or you just want to do a quick lookup. If like if you're just doing an in queue for a specific task, you would just want to do like a read, and then potentially write, um, you know, like which CPU should it be dispatched to or something like that. Right. So it's it's sort of both use cases. So if if update often and it's more like a batch like operation, or right? maybe one comment would be like, this this uh, socket map, no. 
this local storage socket map iterator already. So it it iterate it run BP program to all the socket in this map. So maybe something similar could be done for the task local storage. Yeah. I mean maybe it's a uh it's hard to say. I mean, again, this is the scheduling path, right? So it's like you're trying to get the scheduling decision done within like tens of microseconds at most. So having round trips to user to, to user between user space and kernel space could be problematic, but but maybe not. It's it's something worth exploring for sure. So so if I understand correctly, the the problem is that the interface for read to read and write is a syscall, and that's too slow because you want to do stuff a lot from user space? That's right, yeah. Um, so why is not more of it in BPF, I guess? Like, what's the thing that's preventing moving these parts that need a lot of, like, iterating or updating weights or stuff? Why doesn't that exist in BPF, where the okay. overhead is a lot lower? That's a great question. So the reason that it doesn't exist in BPF for Ghost is because Ghost is, is specifically a user space scheduling framework. Um, in general, so for SCEDI-XE, for Atropo, the, the one that we were talking about, um, we do only load balancing in user space, and you could do it in BPF, but the idea, we're trying to find like a layer where we push the really complex stuff out of BPF and into user space when it's not run quite as frequently. Um, and then in, uh, in BPF, we do like the hot paths, like in queue and stuff like that. So they, they really need like the extremely fast lookups in user space for, for Ghost. But even then, I mean, we like, we you can't like the, the correct abstraction for 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 Skeddy XC, which isn't being done very very frequently. In my opinion, would be um, using the the local storage map type, right? Because that's that's like what the map is sort of designed for. So it's it's not really performance as much for that case. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I last comment and then yeah. yeah. For the BPF iterator, you can do a lot of aggregation in your BPF program and uh, summarize. The or crucial results in a map, for example, or per CPU, or the global variable, global array, and then user space can use that global array with uh, your, your partial analysis results and uh, in user space to make decisions. So you have two layers, right? You have a global array, and the BPL program will iterate all the tasks and then give some partial information in this global array. It's memory mapped, and uh, the user space can use that global map uh, I can write map the now. stuff and to do a quick decision. Is that map writable as well? I think so. Okay, it's important because that's right? where it's the a global variable, right? right? Yeah, I mean, it's again, like right. like like a lo globally or excuse me, like statically sized arrays. Yeah, is, yeah, is a it solution should be also, right? so, readable, so. Uh, writable, and then BPL program has access to that global array as well. Yeah, it's worth exploring. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.